As the 1960s began, the town of Asbestos was doing very well as the fireproof mineral was added to more and more domestic, everyday goods. But things were about to change very quickly. While the Quebec asbestos industry seemed to be doing fine within Canada, with no concerns on the health effects of the mineral being voiced by union heads, government officials, the media, or the Canadian Medical Association, this was certainly not the norm. Even industry heads secretly expressed bewilderment over the fact that the negative health effects of asbestos were a non-issue in Canada, as they continued to fund and edit medical reports that covered up the reality of what was happening to the asbestos workers of Quebec and the world. had been developing in Britain since the death of Nellie Kershaw in 1924. Although Kershaw died of the lung disease asbestosis, in 1960 British doctor E. E. Keel published a revolutionary article in The Lancet that stated that while the majority of male subjects with asbestosis died of carcinoma of the lung, the bulk of the female asbestos-related deaths in Britain were actually caused by carcinoma of the ovary and breast, suggesting that the interaction between asbestos and the female body was unique. Gill's publication on asbestos and health radically shifted our understanding of occupational and environmental disease, as well as our understanding of human bodies. However controversial Keel's conclusions were, and they certainly were, they inspired medical professionals to look closer at the potential diseases asbestos caused. Unlike traditional cancers, environmental ones are often made up of more than a cluster of bad cells, and actually have pieces and particles of the contaminating product in them. Breast cancer caused by asbestos can actually have microscopic asbestos fibers within the tumor. Doctors just have to know and want to look for it. In 1944, Johns Manville had been forced to investigate the high rate of absenteeism among female employees at the Jeffrey Mines textile factory, traditionally the dustiest and therefore the most dangerous place to work in asbestos. The absentee rates were put down as simply the cause of women generally not showing up to work regularly due to female fatigue, but company doctors were certainly not interested in opening these women up to potentially find yet another cancer the valuable mineral caused. The threat of cancer really began to affect the asbestos industry after Keel's publication in 1960. As more and more cases occurred and lawsuits began among factory workers in the United States, there was little companies like Johns Manville could do to contain the issue aside from denying it, continuing to blame South African asbestos instead of Canadian, sanding off the mandatory warning labels on asbestos shipments, and a number of other ploys short of saying, well, the bad news is you have cancer, but the good news is the tumor won't catch fire. In 1967, Liverpool dock workers, not the softest bunch in the group, refused to unload shipments of Canadian asbestos, and in 1968, asbestos was banned in Britain. What? No, 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 no. What I mean when I say asbestos was banned in Britain is South African asbestos was banned in Britain. Because, of course, there's no way Canadian asbestos could be bad. I bet you it tastes like maple syrup. It's so gosh darn sweet. This again shows the amazing power behind a united asbestos front made up of companies all over the world with vested interests in the Canadian asbestos industry, which, as it turns out, is just as toxic as the South African one.
As the 1970s began, the town of Asbestos really started to feel the repercussions of the global shift away from the mineral as more and more people grew to suspect Canadian asbestos was actually pretty terrible. In 1975, as workers began to be laid off due to a dwindling demand for the mineral, Quebec's asbestos workers went on strike. Those in the community of Tedford Mines, where Turner Renewal was in operation, lobbied for better wages and higher standards for health and safety. While joining those on strike in Tedford, workers in the town of Asbestos left health concerns off their list of grievances. Quebec Asbestos miners were the highest paid miners in Canada, and the principal concern of the people of Asbestos at the time when the industry began to really struggle was job security, not health. In the 1970s, Johns Manville had actually started to inform its workers in asbestos when and why they got sick, and made wearing respirators mandatory while working at the Jeffrey Mine. Despite this policy, shift leaders continuously complained to company officials that workers refused to wear the respirators, partly because they clogged so easily, and when Johns Manville sent a film crew to the community to make a pro-asbestos documentary, the producer was horrified at the lack of safety standards being upheld at the mine and at the amount of asbestos dust covering the community. So much so that children wrote their names in the deadly dust covering local cars. Needless to say, it wasn't a great company. The global asbestos industry loomed large in the town of Asbestos, Quebec at the end of the 1970s. But the community, built on land once considered golden, now considered deadly, was not going to let this happen easily. 